and thank you everyone for joining us today. I am Amit Saxena along with my teammates from Jackson Paul Pharmaceuticals Limited, Dr. Deepika Chawra. I am delighted to welcome you all today to the academic sessions on cesarean section by esteemed experts. Today's discussions are brought to you by Nari Division of Jackson Paul's Pro Retro. 10 milligram tablet, a fully indigenous developed bioequivalence by Titrogestron brand with 363, uh, 36 months of shelf life. A warm and hearty welcome to extreme experts and all the attendees. Dear attendees, we request you to post your questions, suggestions, clarifications by text in the Q&A box. Please note this webinar is streaming live on Facebook and the link has already been shared on the chat box. To refer this webinar in the future, please visit our YouTube channel, Jackson Paul Medical Insights. As we initiate this today's session, we request coordinator Dr. Trishra Dimre, Treasurer ISOPAP, Vidarbha chapter to kindly initiate the program. Good evening, one and all. Respected seniors, teachers, and colleagues over this webinar, giving a safe and comfortable environment to an expectant mother is what we all must focus on. And that's why we are here today. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. And that's why we are here today with a within continuation of serving maternal lives, saving maternal life series on LSCS revisited sailing through complications. And our pillars are none other than Deuli Sangli Obstetric Gynec Society, Association of Maharashtra OBGY Society, as well the Isopark Vidharbha chapter. To start with, I would like to call upon our most dynamic and the enthusiastic women. The women who does it all every single day is none other than Dr. Surekha Taide, ma'am, a chairperson, elect clinical research committee, Foxy, president, ISOPA, Vidarbha chapter, and president of Devli Sangli OBGY. Ma'am, I'm welcoming you here for your welcoming address. As well, I would like to tell the, all the delegates as well the panelists that today's convener for the program is none other than Dr. Rashmi, uh, Rashmi Kharodkar Kahar and my co-colleague as a coordinator is Dr. Jaya Turaskar, who is the secretary of Devli of City Gynec and Society. So over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Trishula, thank you very much. Never stop learning because life never stops teaching. The capacity to learn is a gift. The ability to learn is a skill. And the willingness to learn is a choice. So here we are today by choice, all of us uh, as panelists who are joining together with our participants for this webinar on saving maternal lives. The Devli Savangi Ubijiwai Society, under the ages of MOX and Isopark Vidarbha chapter. I, Dr. Surekha Daire, the convener of today's program, take this opportunity to welcome you all to this wonderful teaching learning opportunity, which we have you know, well chosen uh, the LSCS as our focus of today's webinar, because this is one of the most important and most commonly performed operations and learning and honing our skills is so important so that we can sail through any complication which faces us without hassles. I take this opportunity to welcome you all. And with all of you on the dais, we would like to join us, uh, request you to join us for the last fight. <laughs> May God Saraswati bless all of us. I take this opportunity to welcome our chief guest for today, Dr. Rajendra Singh Pardesi, sir, our guests of honor, Dr. Kiran Kutsporti, sir, and Dr. Sujata Dalvi, ma'am, our speakers, uh, Dr. Mitra Saxena, then we have Dr. Manju Puri and Dr. Shashilata Kabra. And we have our chairpersons for today, Dr. Lakshmi Shrikhandi, ma'am, Dr. Kalyan Barmade, Dr. Sujata Dalvi, ma'am, Dr. Kiran Pandey, and Dr. Manoj Aglave. So let me introduce our chief guest to the house. We have Dr. Rajendra Singh Pardesi, sir, 
who is best known as a mentor and friend to all of us. Though is he is in such a uh, lofty post in Amongst, he is the president of Amongst, but all of us consider him as a person who holds a hand, each and everybody's hand in the hour of need. So uh, welcoming Dr. Rajendra Singh Pardesi, sir, who is presently the president of Amox, and uh, we all of our, um, uh, us know him very, very well as a person who leads to the front in Amox as well as in Foxy. Over to you, sir, for your pearls of wisdom. Good evening, everybody. Respected Dr. Nandita, Dr. Kiran Kurtakoti, Dr. Mitra Saxena, Dr. Sujata Dalvi, Dr. Lakshmi Srikande, Dr. Kiran Pandey, Dr. Kalyan Baramde, and many more dignitaries like Dr. Jyoti Banglowala also, Shivaji I, Shivaji Treasurer. She is also present there. I'm feeling proud to be a part of this webinar, which will be solely devoted to reduce MMR. As you all know, maternal complications of LSCS, obstructive labor, and all other, they will contribute around 8 to 10% causes of MMR. We have to reduce MMR still low. No doubt, Maharashtra is quite in successful of achieving the SDG goals of under 70, MMR under 70. Our MMR is 38, but still we have to reduce it up to a single digit. For this, I congratulate Dr. Surekha Taide for organizing this webinar. I salute to Surekha Taide, Dr. Rashmi Kaha, Trishala Temre, Jaya Tulaskar, and Team Devli Saungi with Isopar Vidar chapter for organizing such an academic and practical webinar to reduce MMR. Those who are working for the health of women and to reduce MMR, I salute them. With the galaxy of speakers like Mitra Saxena, Dr. Manju Puri, Dr. Surekha Taide, Dr. Shashikala, and Chairperson, this will be going to be a great webinar. Please enjoy this academic feast. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you very much, sir, for those wonderful words of encouragement for all of us. And we will always be seeking your guidance and support to keep on continuing these activities. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, now we would like to invite uh, a very uh, important person. One line which describes him is a friend in need is a friend indeed. And that is what is Dr. Kiran Purkoti, who is from Pune. He is vice president of uh, MOX presently, but he has served as a chairperson of MTP committee of MOX, as well as uh, he has served as a, a chairperson of the medical education research and training in MOX. And he has also been serving and doing a lot of work as, as a medical legal person who assists all of us when there are uh, any problem as far as the medical legal uh, concerns are there. So uh, Dr. Kiran, uh, we would like to hear from you and your guidance for the forum. Yeah. Respected Dr. Paradeshi sir, President of AMOX, uh, today's conveners, Dr. Surekha Taide, Dr. Rashmi Kahar, and uh, the coordinators, Trishala and Dr. Jaya, and of course, all my friends in Pune and of course, Fox team. First of all, congratulations to you, Dr. Sureka, for uh, your elevation to the post of the Clinical Research Committee of Foxy. Indeed, Amox is blessed by people like you who are going to take Amox forward in the National Forum. Uh, in the same way you have done today, that you have amalgamated not only the Devi Savangi Society, but also ISOPAP into uh, Amox uh, webinar. So that's a good thing that we are doing. So we are crossing the boundaries of Maharashtra. And uh, therefore, I would uh, like to appreciate and acknowledge the efforts which have you have taken. Now, recently, uh, uh, as far as the attacks on doctors are concerned, both the cases we know at the national as well as at in 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 Amman Nagar, uh, both were post C sections. So indeed, we as doctors must fight against unitedly against this particular menace of mob violence. At the same time, we must also 
uh, educate ourselves and our people into uh, how to practice safely uh, 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 such a common operation like a C-section. So congratulations to you for this particular topic and this particular webinar. And I uh, appreciate that, that you will take it further and uh, associate more and more organizations with them also. Thank you so much. And welcome on platform, Dr. Manju, uh, Dr. Mitra Saxena, Dr. Jyoti, and all others, Dr. Shashikala uh, Kabra, and everyone uh, on the Maharashtra phone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kiran. And yes, the context which you brought in about the recent uh, problems which we have faced as far as the cesarean section and difficulties related to BPH management and uh, the context is really uh, going to bring this webinar uh, to more, uh, uh, you know, the importance and rightly said we would uh, make efforts to uh, give some insights and some skill training to our participants through uh, uh, our presentations today. So over to you, uh, Dr. Srishila, for carrying uh, forward the scientific sessions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank thanks a lot, Dr. Surika Taideman, Dr. Padvisi sir and Koti Koti sir, for uh, as you have showered your words of wisdom for every one of us to further go into the details and for the better understanding now we are here with our scientific session and to begin with our first scientific session is for the Miss Gavla Dutch technique to know perfectly we are having to know perfectly we are having a perfectionist academician uh, chairing today's session who is a chairperson but she is chairperson of ICOG Dr. Lakshmi Prikande ma'am and she is a founder patron as well as the senior vice president and a Nagpur Ratna awardee. Ma'am is busy in a lots many citizen section today she will perform. So uh, I thank to Dr. Manoj Aglave sir to he has consented to be the chairperson. He is a consultant laparoscopic surgeon. He is the secretary of the Bhandara OBGYN Society as well. I invite Dr. Mitra ma'am uh, who is a well-known a well-known faculty internationally and nationally ma'am you are the chairperson of the practical obstetric committee foxy you are a past president and a patron you are a convener and a project director you have got your contribution to the national and international forum on aicog is uh, cannot be measured so i welcome dr uh, uh, mitra saxena ma'am <clears throat> so at the outset uh, I want to thank Dr. Sureka Taide for doing an excellent job in bringing together a good, uh, you know, faculty seniors as guests who give such good advices. And, uh, you know, she's, what is it called? It's called economy of resources. So the three organizations, ISOPAP, MOGS, and Devali Savangi Society, they're coming together. But the topics that we are going to be discussing today is something which each obstetrician in our country is being subjected in their own single setup or as a team or in corporate. So the topic which Sureka has given to me is Ms. Gaff Ladakh technique. So friends, at the outset, I want to give a disclaimer that it is due to this topic that uh, I was reviewing, I got an opportunity to even you know, use it because I am one of those who is a proponent for the panel steel insertion and the routine cesarean section. So anyhow, I do hope that just like it was very informative for me to revise this Ms. Gav Ladek technique, and I hope to make it uh, simplified and easy for everybody. So the importance is that when we were postgraduates, uh, the uh, technique to open abdomen, this was in 1984, 86, it was still midline vertical insertion and fan and steel was a fancy. So uh, the uh, taboo around fan and steel itself was that it is tougher, it takes time, it's more cosmetic, et cetera, et cetera. But over the next three or four decades, we've seen that fan and steel is a really very, very useful insertion and it almost covers every requirement of an obstetrician, even if in the toughest situation. However, what is different in Ms. Gav Ladakh technique? It is interesting to note that Joel Cohen, who was the surgeon who opened the abdomen with this technique, and this uh, technique is actually practiced in a hospital called Misgav Ladakh in Jerusalem. So what is important to remember is that we are using minimum instruments. We are using 
the anatomical planes to separate instead of using scalpel scissors to cut and um, make pl a place for the your know, uterine incision the, this is the basic uh, you know uh, tagline that there is manual manipulation restrictive in the use of sharp instruments so what we are doing is that um, everything is faster more economical we are following the anatomical planes and avoiding more bleeding and it is a very very atraumatic uh, procedure because we are using our fingers dextrally so coming to the incision which is the first thing this joel cohen incision as we know uh, fanon steel is a curvilinear incision right above the pubic symphysis but and of course it is because it gets hidden in the pubic hairline it's more beautiful and it's called the bikini scar joel cohen incision is about 4 to 5 cm above fan and steel it's a it's a horizontal straight line and it is 3 cm below the line that joins the anterior superior iliac spine so if we look at this diagram we understand if we were to revise our anatomy the rectus muscles when they are coming closer to the pubic symphysis both the bellies are very close whereas higher up both the bellies are already at a distance to each other from the midline so if you remember this basic advantage by placing this incision higher up we are going to get less um, opportunity to disrupt the rectus because they are already separated naturally so what we are going to do is that the, how the uh, sharp dissection is minimized is that a horizontal incision that can be made by scalpel or pottery and the length of the wound is you know approximately we place a 7 inches um alice forceps that there's roughly the length of the incision that should uh, be sufficient to extract the baby and here after the the skin has been incised the subcutaneous tissue is not cut only in the middle portion it is incised right up to the fascia so that's what we are going to do that the subcutaneous fat is not cut through and through rather we deepen the incision only in the midline and once uh, that is done we go up to the fascia and bluntly separate the fascia a little bit and then use our fingers and hands to separate the uh, open the uh, rectus fascia also transversely um, just by you know that is the line of the fibers so it separates out you don't have to cut the sheath and you have to just separate out and it gets easily separated and no sharp dissection of the sheath excepting in the middle part now once we are there if we go in the upper part the rectus is already separate uh, separated naturally in the upper part because it's a higher incision so here all we have to do is put two or three fingers and in the upper part you between this gap you have to uh by digital separation of the peritoneum the general peritoneum is open this is a key point we do not cut the peritoneum just use our fingers and keep separating it and we are able to tear up the peritoneum and open it another thing is that the peritoneum is opened as high as possible and transversely it is open the good thing is that because we are not stretching it before so once we have opened the peritoneum we put our hands on either side and separate and open up the whole um, incision so the subcutaneous tissue the sheath and the peritoneum everything gets separated out and we get enough space to carry on the further for the surgery in fan and steel because it's a lower incision so you have to separate the sheath from the muscle belly and that causes more bleeding and uh, upper and the lower uh, flap of the rectus has to be separated from the rectus sheath to make space so this is one very very important and very useful uh, improvisation in the misgav ladak technique that we are utilizing the natural separation and getting easier to separate and make room now these are just uh, images from a clip i'm going to be showing you later 
it's very easy to separate out and open the whole abdomen just by um, your fingers. So once all the walls of the abdomen are separated out, stretched by our hands, then we incise through the visceral peritoneum one centimeter above the superior aspect of the bladder. And the peritoneum with the bladder is reflected inferiorly with a swab so that the bladder flap is raised. A small transverse hysterotomy incision is made in the midline. And this is again, the uterine incision is increased by separating it transversely. In the end, I will be telling some important variations to the Ms. Gavlarek technique, which we have modified. Once the uterus is open transversely, the baby is extracted. And the punchline here is that after the removal of the placenta, the uterus is exteriorized. And once the uterus is exteriorized, we all know there is a definite advantage because the whole incision line is visible. The uterus can be you know, tackled very nicely. We know the tone of the uterus. And once that is done, the cavity is cleaned and the uterine closure. Important thing about the uterine closure is that after the uterus is exteriorized, a single layer closure is done in Ms. Gavlada technique, wherein the, it is a locking suture and whole thickness from serosa, mucosa, um, myometrium, and uh, endometrium. All the layers, the desidua, all are taken in an interlocking suture, running suture from one angle to the other, ensuring complete hemostasis. After the uterus has been closed and with an uh, abdomen is mopped, then you have to deposit the uterus and close the sheath. The important thing is that the visceral peritoneum and the parietal peritoneum, both are not stitched, they're left like that. And then the sheath angles are held and the sheath is closed by running suture, as, uh, which is not locking. And after that, the skin is closed with two or three interrupted skin sutures. In between, LS forceps is placed so that the uh, uh, ends come together. So it is a very minimalistic surgery. And that is what is uh, Ms. Gavlarek technique. I've already uh, explained all these things that has been uh, written in this slide. So now let's go and see a short clip. This uh, video has been downloaded uh, courtesy with the help of Sureka. It is from the Jerusalem hospital itself. And I've tried to just edit it and make it quick for all of us to see. So the horizontal incision, which is about four to five centimeters above the pubic symphysis, and we see they're working only in the middle area. So, and once the peritoneum, uh, sorry, the subcutaneous tissue is, why is it not moving? Actually, they do it so fast and they're only using, what is important is they used only scalpel, little bit of scissors and the retractor. Something is wrong. So they stretch the low uterine segment, deliver the baby, Everything is fast forwarded so that I can show the whole clip. And once the placenta has been removed, they're doing MRP, the uterus is exteriorized and the cavity is clean. The edges of the uterus is held with green armitage and then single layer locking sutures. So what we are noticing in Ms. Gavladek technique, it is quick. They're using the anatomical planes to separate the layers of the abdomen, and the uterus and the sheath, everything. And they're also very economical in the use of the suture material. See how far away they're placing the uh, stitches and not like us very, very close and very, very tight. Because I believe if it is too tight, it can do strangulation. And maybe that is one of the reasons that there can be poor healing if there is too much of a tightness. So the tension has to be just appropriate and it is, locking sutures. This is the, actually, this is the Ms. Gav Ladakh technique, 
So right now, of course, there's plenty of literature to say that we do not lock the uh, uterine suturing and it is running sutures we can, and two layer closure is better than uh, single layer. So now this is one paper which is very nicely compared the Mizgav Ladakh uh, Joel Cohen technique with fan and steel. And we find this is of course a little bit partial cases in fan and steel were less. I can't see because my slide is coming. So anyhow, uh, in this technique, one layer suture, two layer, plutonium is unsutured in this Mizgav Ladakh technique. There is in fennel steel incision, lots of modifications are there. Uh, we stop using, closing the visceral peritoneum, but the parietal peritoneum is closed. So in the results, if the results are compared, this is a paper uh, cited in uh, PubMed, uh, the post-operative febrile morbidity, local infection of wound, mean time of extraction of neonate, mean duration of operation, hospitalization, suture material, use of post-operative analgesic, everything was significantly less in the Joel Cohen method, Bizgav uh, Larek technique. So actually friends, while I'm showing these slides, I would really ask all my esteemed delegates, those who are listening and who are doing cesarean sections every day. So in the chat box, please write, what is your technique? It will be very interesting, Sureka, and for all of us to know what is the trend that in North, we are doing a lot of fan and steel incisions still. And I believe with my discussions with Sureka that you all are doing Joel Cohen incisions. And definitely when I used it yesterday, I was very much comfortable. So these are the steps which I've already elaborated. And what is important, as I already said, that the although it's not so beautiful cosmetically, the Joel Cohen incision, because it is a horizontal scar and it is slightly up and it is visible. But the ease of uh, you know, opening the abdomen, going fast, bringing out the baby, and uh, everything is much more simpler and less uh, you know, um, bleeding. Because here, when we are separating the muscles, the injury to the inferior epigastric vessels is much less in Joel Cohen incision as compared to fan and steel. So this is a definite distinct advantage of this um, incision and the technique. So um, what is, uh, finally, I would say that um, we've already recounted, I've already, but you know, everybody is doing uh, their modification of either fan and steel or misgap, and there is a mix and match. And we, uh, those who are in the private sector, and who are able to audit our own surgeries by you know, subjecting our patients to V bags or opening their abdomens. So we are our best judge. We know whether there are any adhesions or how was the scarring, how was the healing. So I think all of us, when we are doing our procedure, that would be a very good way to evaluate our surgery by looking at our times, everything, all these um, parameters which are being you know, discussed as advantages of Joel Cohen and the pan and steel. What is our operating time? How much of blood loss we are having? How many times have we, uh, you know, managed <clears throat> retro um, um, rectus sheath uh, hematoma or something? So it is very important that we should know another technique which has been there, but it is not very popular. I would still say that the cosmetic advantage of and then seal and rest, almost everything, you know, matching. Um, a lot of people in our country are doing pan, uh, uh, this is section by the fan and seal uh, incision only. But definitely, if adopt this technique, we look at it, it is more economical, visible use of suture material and the time consumed and respecting the tissue planes. We're not using sharp instruments, instead, we are using our fingers. So <clears throat> some important variations which I thought is really uh, interesting and quite significant is that many people have stopped making a bladder fat because there's no definite advantage of dissecting the bladder. You place the incision on the lower uterine segment above the bladder and there is no additional advantage because we are not going to suture the visceral peritoneum. 
So I think the need to make a flap is not very important. Now, this is very important, how the uterine incision is stretched. In Vizgav Ladakh technique, it was stretched transversely because they're going along the fibers. But what has been shown is that if the uh, incision is stretched craniocordally, then the incision expands, but it doesn't go up to the uterine uh, vessels and it doesn't cause tearing. So this is a definite you know, uh, recommendation and to the guidelines that the uterine incision should be stretched craniocordally. We do not exteriorize every uterus. Wherever there are extensions, then definitely exteriorization really is a lifesaver. And with the use of AMTSL, there is no need for MRP. Instead, if there is MRP, there are more chances of endometritis, and there's no need to mop the cavity clean with the <clears throat> mop. The, if there is a distinct advantage of closing in two layers without locking less chances of uterine rupture or diesis as compared to single uh, layer closure. And the sheet, which is really, really important to prevent any incisional apnea, it needs to be secured best and the um, stitches to be taken one centimeter apart and one centimeter from the edge. And as per the recommendations, the length of the suture material should be at least a length, uh, one and a half times the length of the incision. So I want to conclude my talk. I hope I'm in time. This is the patient that I did. She's a 105 kg woman, third time, her previous two sections. This is the mons pubis. This is her fennel steel incision. And actually I've always gone through the same incision, but after having given, been given this talk, I thought this is the time for me to test for myself how the Ms. Gavladech incision behaves. Um, in, uh, Joel Cohen incision. And I'm happy to tell you that I actually spent less time opening the abdomen because the recti were almost there sitting apart. And it was very easy for me to go up, open the peritoneum and stretch it. And definitely I avoided this very fat panis. And basically now this is the first time I have not used subcuticular stitches and not close the subcutaneous tissue. Just put four or five interrupted and I hope I'll come back with the uh, results of healing. She's second day today. She's doing very well. Anyhow, the post-op is almost the same for my patients. The equal requirement, not necessarily more or less of uh, painkillers, but definitely patient is absolutely fine. So thank you so much for the patient hearing. I do hope our uh, listeners have put in the chat box their choice of incisions and any variations that they are doing. Because I believe, uh, friends, that teaching is learning twice. And from your comments also, maybe we pick up a good um, you know, hint or two. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Zareka. you. Thank you, Dr. Mitra. I think uh, uh, my aim of choosing the topic has been fulfilled by the way you have compared and contrasted both the techniques. But uh, let me tell you that we have been using the Joel Coins incision and the Misgav Ladak technique since 20 years. And all our students do uh, a cesarean section by, by Ms. Gavla Duck Technique, Dr. Jaya Kore Kutoraskar, who is the secretary of the DSOH. She's my student and she will vouch that everybody here, uh, we are teaching dual coins and Ms. Gavla Duck. Uh, but as you said, there, there are certain modifications which we have brought into place and that one of them is not exteriorizing the uterus. Another one is not doing MRP and not mopping the cavity. Otherwise, everything, the JC incision is the standard. We haven't used fan and steel for years together. And I think I, I, I will never use fan and steel incision because the JC one is the best which has worked for us. And we even do, uh, you know, uh, we, we do not close the peritoneum. That's one thing which is JC, uh, which Ms. Gavalada uh, is saying. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, I can tell you uh, that I am using a subcuticular stitch for skin 
But my professor, Dr. Professor Chabra, who has brought in this technique very, very early when she went to Sweden, from there she learned and she brought into MGM and Sevagram. And from her, we have started learning this. She uses the exact same technique for skin sutures. You know, only three sutures she will put on the skin and uh, wide apart. And very nicely, uh, it, I think the video also shows the skin take the skin closure also that is how she has been uh, you know three sutures only for uh, skin and for <clears throat> years together she has been doing this and with very very good result no subcutaneous stage in the subcutaneous fat layer what however big it may be however obeys the patient <clears throat> so uh, sureka what but i wanted to share one, is one last word and yeah, then we yeah, can hear from you but I think, as we see in the chat box, there are various techniques which have been being used by various people. So here is the time comes the clinical research committee now, where we need to find out who does what and what is the outcome. And over to you now. So uh, what I wanted to say is that when I was a postgraduate, uh, we only saw one or two phenyl steel. Then when I had the opportunity to go to Middle East, every cesarean was done in fan and steel. I was very scared, but I picked up the fan and steel. When I came back to India in 95, I was the first one to start cesarean sections in fan and steel. So 95 onwards, five years of that, 22 years now. So it is 27 years for, uh, for me as well that I've been doing fan and steel, repeat fan and steel, repeat fan and steel. In fact, those who have vertical incisions, I go uh, fan and steel only and have never had any problems touch wood. I've been able to do my own VMAX. I've been able to open abdomen without any adhesions. And I'm not closing the visceral peritoneum, but I'm closing the general peritoneum because I found that in Delhi, they were keeping both the peritoneums you know, unstitched and patients I would get from Delhi, the peritoneum would be stuck on the uterus. So call it myth or call it whatever fantasy, but we modified our own technique. Are you so uh, I can say that uh, this is one place, all the techniques, uh, we will be the best judge to use it in our patient. For example, for this extremely obese patient, I found this Joel Cohen incision a beauty. I would have gone, had I not done this talk, I would have gone through my feminine teeth and then I would have tried to strap the fat up when I'm closing. I'm happy to say that my incisions may kabhi bhi uh, infection nahi hua hai. Subcuticular it is always. So, well, we are always learning all the time. Thank you, ma'am. Manoj, Manoj yeah. comment as he's the chairperson. We would like Dr. Manoj to please say something. Dr. Uh, Aglave, Manoj Aglave. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello, good evening to all of you. It's an excellent presentation, and uh, Madam has depicted all very nicely the Misgav Ladakh technique. And uh, with the laser anesthesia and the visual surgical time, we can. Uh, prevent the uh, complications of the anesthesia and uh, prolonged surgery. And a very nice presentation. And thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to share the session. Thank Just you. like to know from Manjupuri, madam, uh, whether they are doing the Ms. Yavaladha. Madam, this question answer will be at the end of the session or now? No, we just move uh, ahead after my, Dr. Manju has... Uh, and if we have any yeah. questions... Uh, thank you, Dr. Yes. Sureka. Actually, uh, we were a part of coroner's trial. So that is the time when we started with the, you know, uh, the Joel Cohen incision. And uh, we have not followed the technique uh, completely. Uh, but we are actually using a mixed technique, if you ask me. So there are some people who are doing fen and steel. So no protocol per se, but I think high time that we have a protocol. And in any case, I think if you are using less of uh, sharp instruments, less of cutting, uh, the uh, results are much better. Less sutures if you use, so the results are much better. But of course, no MRP, uh, no uh, exteriorization, no, exteriorization. no single layer closure, uh, but we close parietal peritoneum, uh, same way as Mitra has said that we found some adhesions and we thought that closing the peri parietal peritoneum may be okay. Yeah. Can so we have some comments from Jaya because she's the one who has learned Ms. Gavlata. 
from all of us. <laughs> yeah, please and unmute. Most of the steps uh, we are doing by uh, Ms. Gao uh, Ladakh only. Uh, only thing what I feel is extraization. I feel better sometimes because we can see the posterior part of uterus also. And uh, in some, there are many schools of thoughts also which are saying it decreases the blood loss by stretching of the uterine arteries. So we go for extraization. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Mitra Saxena, ma'am, for your practical tip and how to proceed with the techniques has enriched all of us as well. Thanks to the Dr. Surekha, ma'am, Dr. Aglave, and Dr. Jaya. No, no. Jaya, ma'am? Jaya, no. Who is Manju, ma'am? For your valuable inputs. It's truly said that God cannot be everywhere. That is why he created doctors. So while proceeding to our second session of scientific topic, each and every one is to be taken as a unique experience. Each and every patient is to be taken as a unique experience and with the difficult abdominal entry. We are here with a unique academician, public awareness chairperson of FOXI, Amazonian coordinator of AMOX, joint secretary IG, Dr. Kalyan Burmade, sir, you are requested to share the session and enlighten us with the ways and means of entering into the ab abdominal cavity in the difficult LSS. And I'm requesting Jaya ma'am to kindly take over for the further scientific sessions. Thank you. Thanks for giving me opportunity. Sir, Dr. Kalyan Burmade, sir. Over to you. Sir is not there, so we would... Uh, uh, um... Request Dr. Manoj to please continue being a chairperson for this session also and uh, kindly uh, uh, introduce our speaker, Dr. Manju Puri. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Manoj, please. Hello. Dr. Manju Puri, madam, is a, she's a director, professor, and former HOD at the Department of Obstetrics and LHMC, New Delhi. She is the presently the chairperson of SAP Motherhood Committee of FOXI. She is a national coordinator of practical obstetrics and committee. She has presented many papers in national and international conferences. She had edited the books in anemia and pregnancy, and, uh, management of high-risk pregnancy, a practical approach, and clinical methods in obstetrics and gynecology. Her area of interest is high-risk obstetrics and reproductive endocrinology. Over to you, Manju Puri. Thank you, Dr. Surekha. And, uh... Dioli Sawangi uh, Obzen Gaini Society for having inviting me here for this uh, very important practical uh, uh, webinar on LSCS. Uh, and uh, the academic program has been very well planned. And I bring you greetings from Lady Harding Medical College. And I'll be now deliberating on uh, the first aspect, and that is a difficult abdominal entry. Uh, now, we know that cesarean section is usually perceived as a simple and safe alternative to natural birth. Uh, but in some instances, it may be technically difficult uh, with consequent health hazards, both uh, for the mother and the fetus. Uh, so the primary sections are, uh, you know, still safer as compared to repeat cesareans. But sometimes even in primary cesarean section, there could be problems. So uh, meaning thereby that natural vaginal birth is uh, cesarean is not a safer alternative to natural vaginal birth and not natural vaginal birth is what needs to be promoted. The possible causes of difficult cesarean sections are divided into four categories. Uh, it, uh, it is difficult access to the lower uterine segment, a complicated fetal extraction, laceration or any organ damage and abnormal placentation. So I'll be focusing on the first part and that is difficult access uh, to the lower uterine segment. And the main important causes which uh, result in difficult access to the lower uterine segment are related to adhesions, that is with previous cesarean section. And we know that with the rising number of cesarean sections, the rising number of previous cesarean sections are also a uh, you know, cause, uh, cause of concern. The second is the change in the patient profile. We have women who are heavier and uh, a number of them are actually obese. So their uh, obesity is what uh, interferes or what causes difficult entry into the abdomen. Uh, the, the third is the leomyoma. Now, leomyoma has nothing to do with access uh, to the abdominal cavity, but it does affect the access to the low uterine segment. 
Now, why are we so much concerned about the uh, uh, difficult access to the low uterine segment? Uh, it is especially when our patients are under general anesthesia. So we are worried about the drug circulating into the body of the mother uh, uh, and then uh, into the baby and affecting the uh, you know, condition of the baby. Uh, cesarean section can, uh, 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 it might take longer in these uh, uh, patients and uh, the increased time required before being able to extract the baby may be associated with adverse neonatal outcomes. So now, most often, if, especially if you're doing emergency cesarean section and there is a difficult entry, that combination uh, can really unnerve the obstetrician and it can result uh, in a lot of complications, uh, inadvertent complications because of the haste and the anxiety on the part of the obstetrician to deliver the baby fast. Now let's look at what is the evidence regarding uterine incision delivery interval and neonatal outcome. So basically there is no robust evidence to support that prolonged uh, incision delivery uh, interval adversely affects the neonatal outcome. Now, let me make it clear. There are two types of incision delivery interval. One is abdominal incision delivery uh, interval, and the second is uterine incision delivery interval. As far as the abdominal incision delivery interval is concerned, there seems to be absolutely no relationship as far as the uh, outcome of the baby is concerned. But as far as uterine incision delivery interval is concerned, the number of studies would put it at uh, about three to four minutes. Now let's understand three to four minutes is quite a bit of time, but because we, the, while we are operating, we would think everything is getting delayed. So we tend to hurry up. So the mechanism which is actually affecting or which causes uh, you know, uh, the uh, adverse impact on the neonate is thought to be the hysterotomy induced reduced uterine perfusion, which results in activation of fetal sympathoadrenal system. So that is what affects the fetus. And it is important to note that fetus should be extracted expeditiously, but non-traumatically. So one should not compromise uh, on you know, causing damage to the mother or the baby uh, to, in order to expedite the delivery of the fetus. The usual accepted uterine uh, induction, uh, insertion delivery interval is about three to four minutes. Now, uh, this was a study which was published in 1990. Uh, this was long back, uh, wherein they studied a correlation between uterine, this is uterine incision delivery interval. They looked up the fetal catecholamine concentrations in the uh, you know, cord blood and also the fetal blood gas values at delivery. They looked up 25 women undergoing cesarean section under epidural and 28 under spinal. And what they found was that infants delivered after prolonged uterine incision to delivery intervals had significantly higher umbilical arterial catecholamine concentration and lower pH values in both groups, uh, whether it was uh, epidural or spinal. And they concluded that uterine in, uh, incision delivery interval should be minimized irrespective of type of anesthesia. This was way back in 1990. And the study group was very small, 25 women in each group. So it, is, it was not a robust study. Uh, recently, uh, in 2013, uh, we have uh, a prospective cohort study from South Africa. Uh, which was done by Rozu, uh, Jian, and Hall D. They studied the effect of skin to myometrium, myometrium to delivery, and skin to delivery intervals uh, on the immediate neonatal outcomes. Here they had 1120 uh, cesarean sections, which included both emergency and elective cesarean section. And uh, the results showed that uh, although there was a significant increase in the uh, skin um, uh, delivery or uh, myometrium delivery intervals with repeat cesarean section and obesity, but there was no correlation with median values uh, with a five-minute EBGAR of less than seven. And this uh, concluded that obstetrician should not compromise on safe surgical techniques for expeditious delivery of the baby. So now, uh, what are the uh, basic rules, uh, you know, whenever uh, uh, we uh, are faced with difficult situations? The first and the foremost is anticipation and preparedness. We should know which are the patients where we are going to land up into trouble. Uh, the second is uh, to stay calm during surgery, be gentle with the tissues. Uh, and that is then followed by after you finish with the, uh, you know, uh, you've uh, overcome that difficult situation. You need to reflect upon what you did, what was uh, good about what you did and what you could have done better. And then you absorb the lessons learned. And you share those lessons with your peers. So whatever you've learned, it is much better to share it with others. And then, of course, a debriefing session 
uh, with your team and uh, with the family. So all these are the basic rules while dealing with difficult situations. So I'll just go through all these three situations one by one. So pregnancy with previous cesarean section, uh, we know that we face a lot of problems in these patients. It is uh, not, it does not matter whether it's first uh, pre previous one, previous two or previous three. You can have a very bad previous one cesarean section also. So whenever it is previous cesarean section, one needs to be competent as far as, uh, you know, doing a rhizolysis is concerned. So the basic principles here are to make an entry from the virgin area, uh, do a rhizolysis layer by layer, use sharp dissection, and uh, should not use blunt uh, dissection, use traction and counter traction to get into the proper layers, uh, keep the vital structures in mind and direct the tip of your scissors away from them and ensure the presence of an expert. So you must have a backup uh, or a person there in case you are a beginner. So these are the basic principles of doing adhesiolysis. Now, this is a, a video which has been shot by one of our, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, faculty members. Uh, now, uh, you know, it was uh, personally shot by that uh, faculty member. And it is a very nice video which takes into account all the uh, principles which I have talked about. So uh, the sheath, the muscle is very densely adherent to the sheath. So with the help of sharp uh, uh, dissection, with the help of cutting cautery, so the muscle is being separated uh, from the sheath. So this is uh, done, being done so that we could enter the peritoneum from the virgin area. So we try and go, go as high up as possible, uh, you know, um, to try and reach and enter the peritoneum uh, as high as possible. And at the same time, it is important to mobilize the lower part of the incision as well so that you know when you open the peritoneum you have ample space uh, to deliver the baby so now once this was done the two uh, recti were so densely adherent uh, with each other that uh, you know we could not separate them sometimes you can separate them so here you can see that uh, with the help of sharp dissection uh, layer by layer uh, you know uh, adhesions are being uh, cut so uh, she's trying to get into the right spaces so that, you know, uh, she can uh, reach uh, the peritoneum. But now you can see that uh, while she's trying to get into the plane, uh, be because the additions are so dense that, you know, you can see uh, in a while that there is some amount of bleeding which comes. So remember if, uh, you know, while opening the, separating the muscles, you have bleeding coming in, so that is the time you should think that probably you have uh, you are getting into the myometrium because it is only then that so much of bleeding would come. Okay, so again, layer by layer, uh, bit by bit, you are trying to make layers and cut and try to get uh, into a plane where you can reach the peritoneum. But the whole thing was so densely adherent that you know it was difficult uh, to get into it. So now with sharp knife dissection with the finger there, you are, uh, you know, she's trying to get again into the peritoneum and here uh, use of cautery. So you can use cautery, you can use knife uh, and then try to get into the right plane. So, you know, one will try all uh, methods to get into the plane, but the adhesions were very, very dense. So the next step now comes is that once you have separated it in the midline, you can now cut the muscles. So if you uh, cut the muscles, then you can take a lateral window approach uh, because we know that, uh, you know, the adhesions are going to be in the midline. So the only way now you can uh, get into the peritoneal cavity is by cutting the muscles because if you cut the muscles, then you are going away from the area where the adhesions are likely to be, okay? So once, uh, and for this, you clamp the muscles on both the sides, cut it with the help of a, uh, you know, a knife or cautery. And uh, here again, the muscles are being, the lower part of the incision, the muscles are being cut. And here you can see something yellow coming. So that is where, a, 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 you know, window has been made and you can feel, you feel as if the tissue is normal and that's a peritoneum which has come. So once you have reached that peritoneum, you now know that which is the, where is the bladder, which is the upper part of the bladder. And there from the side, basically, you know, this patient has got a 
full band of uh, uh, adhesions in the midline, a thick band. I'm sure most of you who are doing cesareans would have experienced this one time or the other. But once you cut the muscles, then you can put your finger by the side and get across the uh, adhesion in the midline and get into an area where you can uh, actually cut and get the uh, baby out. So uh, now that the finger is there, so you are gently cutting it through. And once you uh, are, you know, once these adhesions are cut, we will see the surface of the uterus and the bladder is pushed there. We know that the bladder is there. It is a smooth area. So from here, the baby will be extracted. So see, you can see that uh, scarred area and the baby will be extracted. So this is a difficult uh, uh, entry, a real difficult entry. Now, this is what uh, the picture would be in this kind of a patient uh, where we have, uh, uh, you know, the entry, which I, the video, which I showed. So here, the midline, the uterus is all adherent to the uh, anterior abdominal wall. So you have to come above this, okay? Or you have to come laterally and then make a space uh, from the side and uh, then get onto the area where you can find out the bladder and then give an incision on the uterus. So I think this is uh, one a very typical kind of problem which you would face. Now, obliterated UV pouch uh, or adherent bladder. Now, basic principles are the same as for adhesions elsewhere. So traction is applied on the peritoneum of the UV pouch uh, uh, fold and sharp dissection the tip of the scissors towards the uterus. And lateral window approach is applied if dense adhesions uh, are there in the central part. So you go and follow the round ligament and you can open the uh, UV fold there. And then from there, you come medially. Uh, 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 and then, uh, you know, you can go below the uh, scar and you will find a space there. And then it becomes easier for you to dissect the scar of the uterus. But beware of uh, close proximity to the bladder if yellow fat or excessive bleeding is there. Now, the next common condition is pregnancy with obesity, not a very uncommon condition. So obesity is no more a problem of the developed world. It is associated with poor perinatal outcome and increased cesarean section rates. And obstetric surgery uh, is challenging and prolonged in these patients. And uh, the transverse incision is better than vertical incision for abdominal entry because uh, the healing and the pain and everything is better with transverse incision. And in women with mild to moderate obesity, sub-umbilical versus supra-umbilical incision is debatable. Uh, you know, in those with severe obesity, we have ample evidence to say that supra-umbilical incision is what is recommended. So you go above the umbilicus. Uh, I'll, in my next slide, I'll show you why. But in those with mild and moderate obesity, you can definitely go with uh, the technique which was described by Dr. Mitra in the previous uh, presentation. Now, this is uh, what happens in cases of morbid obesity. So there is a paniculus here and uh, the abdominal wall adipose tissue uh, can alter the typical anatomical landmarks. So if you look, this is the umbilicus here. So if we try and give our incision in relationship to the umbilicus, we'll stay into the paniculus. We cannot reach the lower uterine segment. So in these cases, a supra umbilical incision is what is recommended. So that means your dependence should not be on the Umbilicus, your dependence should be on uh, uh, bony landmarks, that is ileic crest and pubic symphysis. They are uh, reliable landmarks. And in a woman with paniculus, the umbilicus is displaced caudally, uh, approximately at the level of ileic crest uh, in lower uterine uh, and much caudal to the lower uterine segment. So that is the concept of giving supra umbilical incision, uh, transverse incision in these patients. And we never place the incision uh, below the pediculus. Uh, either, you know, uh, if the patient is mild to moderate obesity, then we would place on the pediculus in case you do not have it folded down. If it is folded down and the patient is morbidly obese, you can uh, palpate the ileic crest and pubic symphysis and then give the incision. The last bit is uh, pregnancy with leomyomas. Leomyomas are present in 3 to 10% of pregnant women. They can cause difficult entry if present on anterior wall on lower uterine segment. Uh, always prefer a vertical abdominal incision whenever you are operating on these patients with fibroids. And make sure that the blood and blood uh, products are available. Classical cesarean section is indicated if lower segment cesarean section is not uh, you know, possible. Historically, cesarean myomectomies are discouraged, uh, which is not very wrong. 
uh, because it does lead on to excessive bleeding while you're doing myomectomies during cesarean section. However, it uh, can be done. It should be in case it is done. Uh, nowadays, we are uh, saying that you know certain uh, myomas can be removed, especially the subserous ones or the ones which are there on the low uterine segment, but we would prefer doing it only after the baby is extracted. In selective cases where there's a subserous uh, fibroid, or after you've given an incision, you know, initially the fibroid may be away, but once you've given the incision, it protrudes into the uh, incision and it becomes difficult to, you know, uh, repair it. So in those cases, uh, instead of, you know, uh, pushing the fibroid in and repairing, uh, it can lead on to a lot of infection. And uh, these are the patients uh, where the fibroid can be removed and you can do a repair. And uh, the lower segment fibroids, if they are present not on the lower segment, you can remove it even before delivery and uh, take out the baby first. Now, practical tips for a safe cesarean biomechanism, build up the hemoglobin in antenatal period, do a myoma mapping if possible, and take informed consent, arrange for blood, open by vertical incision, give incision on the myoma followed by enucleation, Use electrocautery to reduce uh, blood loss because uh, this is to be used only after the baby has been de delivered. And obliteration of dead space, these are the usual principles and overlying serosa to be uh, sutured uh, by continuous absorbable suture. It has to be a continuous absorbable because when if the uterus relaxes, the likelihood of bleeding from the suture line is very high. And that is why we give uh, oxytocin, high dose of oxytocin to these patients in intraoperative and postoperative period. And a second incision for intramural fibroids is not desirable. So we are not going to touch upon intramural fibroids in case they are there. So to summarize, cesarean section is one of the most common obstetric procedures which are performed uh, by obstetricians. Uh, difficult access to low uterine segment is associated with obstetricians' anxiety and panic and resultant increase in maternal and neonatal complications. There is no robust evidence correlating incision delivery interval with poorer neonatal outcomes per se. Knowledge and anticipation of potential technical difficulties at cesarean section provides uh, an obstetrician uh, an opportunity to be better prepared and seek for help prior to getting into trouble and then seeking help. Lateral window approach, whether it is midline incision or it is bladder which is adherent, lateral window approach is useful uh, for midline adhesions. Uh, I remember one of my teachers used to say that even when you're opening the rectus sheath in the midline, you know, that was a midline incision, she would say open it uh, away from the midline because it, it is in the midline that you would find, uh, you know, adhesions. But with phenyl steel, we can't do that. Now, with lower segment leomyomas, they can be removed before delivery of the baby. That is the only uh, uh, condition where you can remove it before the delivery of the baby. And a supraamblical transverse incision must be performed in severe obesity. Uh, so thank you so much for patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Manju. Excellent presentation, I must say. And a wonderful video uh, and a really wonderful take-home messages. And the, the video you have shown, I think many of us and most of us must have come across at least one or two uh, cesarean sections really stuck, you know and no approach anywhere. So definitely we have all have this experience. And I, I really like that one uh, um, uh, slide you showed about the umbilicus moving so very cordially, you know, that we cannot uh, take the umbilicus as the focus point and we have to go above the umbilicus when you want to uh, look at today's patient. So Dr. Manoj, your comments, please. Hello. Thank you, Madam, for your to the point presentation. From your presentation, it is clear that the one should follow the principles of surgery and the knowledge of the anatomy should be clear. I hope your presentation will help our audience to uh, enhance their knowledge and to minimize their complications. But uh, one question to you, Madam. While dealing with the obese patient, if you take the incision about the umbilicus, uh, how it is possible to reach the lower segment to deliver the baby or how it is easy to reach the lower segment? Uh, Dr. Manoj, I do not have any personal experience in operating on these patients, but it looks evident because when you give incision there, the lower segment is right there because it is the paniculus which is down below. And if you give incision below the umbilicus, okay, so you go get into the paniculus only the lower segment you don't reach because the paniculus is at the level of iliac crest. It is at the level of pubic symphysis. So when you give uh, the, the umbilicus is at that level. So the anatomy gets distorted so much that, you know, uh, if you palpate the, anti uh, the anterior spiral crest, 
that would be below the level of, uh, uh, you know, above the level of umbilicus. So it does, when you give an incision there, you hit there. That is what is the, uh, you know, the case reports and the literature says, yeah. Um, there is one more question, Dr. Manju, uh, uh, regarding is it the incision delivery interval you are looking for? Is it the anesthesia, the spinal anesthesia to the delivery of the baby? And is there any difference if in these two intervals as that's far as the, the outcome is concerned? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Sarika, that's a very good question. I uh, again remember my professor, Professor Sushila Rati. So she used to say, we were so worried, no, and GA is given what will happen, what will happen. She said, you take your time, nothing happens to the baby. So, you know, uh, whatever drugs are given, they kind of metabolize very fast. So they do not have a long effect. So I remember delivering babies even half an hour of uh, initial incision. So what yeah. is important, what I have uh, reviewed from the literature, what is important is the myometrial incision delivery interval. Exactly. I think it is only the uterine incision delivery interval, yes. which may have uh, a little effect, but that is also, we do not have any robust evidence, but of course, because the uterus starts bleeding. So I think that should not exceed four to five minutes. Four minutes is what is generally given, right? Definitely, so no other, I think no other we should not done. panic. That's very important. Even if the abdomen and the uterus are stuck to each other, you know, there is no need to panic. We should not make haste and commit mistakes in, in that panic. That is what I think is the take home message. It is not at all the incision on the abdomen also. It is the incision on the uterus. After that, how much time you take, maybe, you know, but even then, if it's a floating head and you are taking time, don't panic. You know, uh, we haven't seen uh, many bad outcomes, even if, you know, time uh, passes like more than five minutes. So uh, I think uh, we should not panic and we should not make haste and you should not cut through things without having a look, you know, whether the bowel or the bladder is there below. And rightly said, if you go a little laterally, possibility of uh, meeting less adhesions in, uh, in the lateral side. So that I think these are the very good take home messages from Dr. Manju. Yeah, Dr. Mitra. I want to say one thing, Manju, that uh, there is a role for being aware that in times of dense adhesions, especially when the peritoneum and everything is stuck to the uterus, it is very important that we should remember that we can do an extra peritoneal cesarean section, making sure that the bladder is away. And when, you know, I've had an opportunity to do one cesarean like this, I just, I was not able to open the general peritoneum at all. And it was a financial previous cesarean. So I had no option. I just made sure that the bladder is away. I opened the uterus, you know, like that. It was an extra peritoneal cesarean. The, parit uh, the abdominal cavity was not opened at all. And it was in a known person. But then extra peritoneal cesarean section, it was by default, only because of very bad additions in the upper part, totally. So, but it was very safe. I mean, uh, fine. I didn't open the peritoneum. So kuch bhi nahi but only thing is that no need to panic. If I had stuck trying to, you know, open the skin incision, go up, I just made sure the bladder niche hai, or ye sara sara chipka hai, to open the uterus and take out the baby and do a extra peritoneal cesarean. Just a, one, so one I request, doctor, yeah. yeah. I agree, agree, but I think cutting the muscle, I think we should uh, do that cutting of the muscle faster and go laterally. I think that, and there you can put a finger around and go up also, and you can. Manju, in this patient that I am telling, I had no room at all. No, no, that is fine. That I fully agree with you. Yes, yes. So yes. I, I had general peritoneum me gusne ka final steel ki incision me. Agreed. I saw three thi vertical me kola hota, to better hota, kuch upper chal gaya thi. But I realized that final steel hai, bladder niche hai, sab kuch upper chipka hua hai, bilkul. So there was no point going upper and then. Coming down. So I, Itradi, I just can say that uh, in dense sedations, you know, GC incision is actually much better. But that, the, but the previous still actually is exactly. too much. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, in, 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 in GC, is much better. Much much better, much better. But, uh, but, but this patient was already in phantom steel and at that time I was in yeah. phantom steel. <laughs> yeah. But I so did thank you very much for that safe. nice discussion. And uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Sujata Dalvi, madam, who is the secretary of uh, AMOX and uh, we, we install secretary uh, general of AMOX. Welcome, madam. And uh, Dr. Jaya.
Uh, can we go to the next session, please? After this wonderful session, let's uh, move to the another interesting one. Uh, that is deeply engaged and floating head, how to manage. The speaker, respected speaker for this session is none other than uh, Dr. Surekha Taide, madam, and chairperson is Dr. Sujata Darvi, madam. It's okay. my honor and uh, privilege to welcome and uh, introduce Dr. Sujata Darvi, madam. Uh, she needs no formal introduction. She is consultant, obstetrician, and gynecologist and multiple hospitals in Mumbai. She is uh, also a uh, clinical associate at Wadia Hospital. She's secretary amongst joint associate uh, editor of Jogi and clinical secretary of M M Mumbai Gynecological Society. I welcome you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for such nice introduction. At an outset, I would like to express my gratitude to Dr. Surekha Taide, convener of today's program, for giving me an opportunity to chair this session. Coming to Dr. Surekha, she's very active. She's always on the move, very hardworking. And conveners of today's program, that is uh, C-section revisited. This is one surgery, which I'm, I must tell you, each and every nook and corner, every obstetrician, this is the commonest surgery that every obstetrician does it at any time of the day and the night. Coming to Dr. Surekha, she has been recently elected as an FOXI Research Committee Chairperson so we know her obvious interest is so much in a research methodology. She's also a president of Isobab Vidarbha chapter and president of Deuli Savangi Obstetric and Gynac Society. She's going to tell you on how to manage a patient with a floating head as well as a deeply engaged head at the time of C-section. Both things are very challenging. And then she's going to tell us the tips and the tricks. So over to Dr. Surekha Taide. Thank you very much, ma'am, and so kind of you to join us in spite of having multiple engagements, madam is with us and that encourages us very much that you have joined and I must tell the, the audience that madam has a lot of uh, uh, publications on this particular topic I have searched when I was searching. Uh, while making this presentation, I found that Madam has one editorial on deeply engaged and floating it. So very kind of you, Madam, to join as chairperson. And uh, uh, let us, uh, 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 I'm going to uh, present to you on this topic, which is very, very important. And greetings from my medical college, which is Jawaharlal Nehru Medical College, where you can see the very beautiful simulation lab, which I am always keep on displaying during my presentation. And thank you very much for in, uh, electing me as the chairperson elect for clinical research committee. And I'm grateful to all of you who have joined here today. So approximately one quarter of the emergency cesarean section performed for failure to progress are actually second stage sections. And uh, we do know that these kind of sections are rising. Why? Because uh, the prolonged labor is one and another is a greater reluctance to perform instrumental delivery. So because instrumental delivery is, you know, the art which is being waning off and becoming almost obsolete. So we are getting more and more cesarean section in the second stage and the deeply engaged head. So now the challenges in these cesarean section is that it is associated with a lot of uh, complication. Basically, there is difficulty in delivering the fetal head because it's quite deeply in, in, inside the pelvics. There may be extension of the uterine wound. And if the uterine wound gets extended, then the uterine arteries get bubbles. Then you may have a broad ligament hematoma also. There is also possibility of postpartum hemorrhage because these have been uh, these women have been in, for, uh, in labor for quite a long time. And of course, the fetal complication were of guard school admissions to neonatal units. So the problems are, again, the lower segment is quite thinned out. Sometimes you may see it is ballooned up and you, you are worried where to give the incision. You are worried of the bladder injury if the bladder gets, you know, elevated. Now, cervix also sometimes is so much taken up. And uh, that is, uh, again, risk of infections in these patients and liker being drained, there is difficulty in extracting the baby. So these are the problems which we face when uh, we look at the C-section in the second stage of the deeply engaged. Principles, as Dr. Manju has already said, anticipate when you are shifting such a patient who is having deeply engaged it and anticipate that there's going to be a problem. 
know, have your OT prepared. And another very important element of preparedness is you should have a very good assistant, you know, to assist you when you are having these kind of C-section to assure that your, uh, your uh, assistant is good. Maybe if you can have an SR or a senior registrar, if you are in the government setup, or if you can have another gynecologist uh, 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 who will be assisting you if it is a... Uh, that's a very, very important point and have a good anesthetist also who, who experience anesthetist also helps many times. And, and important, of course, is to stay calm, assess the patient well and decide what would be your approach, uh, you know, by palpating the abdomen, finding out what is exactly where the baby and how the baby is placed that would also going to help you. So these are the principles we have some options available with us. One of them is delivery by pushing from below. You know, that is called as the abdominal pelvic approach. Another is the patwardhan's technique. The patwardhan could be the original patwardhan or a modified one. And we could also deliver by breath extraction. Now, uh, uh, age old, this is the abdominal uh, vaginal method. I still remember that my professor, Professor Chabra, is always used to prefer the push technique. But in the push technique, the thing to be remembered is the flexion point has to be maintained, you know, and the assistant has to be trained enough that when you push from the from the vagina from below, you know, you have to use the whole palm. The palm has to be placed uh, against the head of the baby. Do not use your full, only tip of your fingers. That may cause extension of the head and uh, that may lead to tears. You know, if the this technique is done well with the hand, the whole of the palm of the hand, you know, in a, in a sort of a cup, and then maintaining the flexion uh, point of the baby, increasing, in fact, the flexion and pushing the baby upward, that is actually uh, the trick of a good abdominal vaginal method. Uh, the old school thought is that the abdominal vaginal method is good, but you have to have a trained uh, train assistant. Otherwise, you're going to have tears. The uterine incision is going to uh, be uh, extended, and that is the problem. Another uh, very good method, which quite uh, has been popular, is the Patwardhan's method. Patwardhan, the original Patwardhan, and there have been some modifications in the Patwardhan. So in the original Patwardhan, as you can see, the one of the arm is delivered first, the same side leg, the other leg, and then the, the, the other arm. That's the original, but yes, Dr. Mitra, that's the original Patwardhan. I will I'll tell you the modification also, I will tell you uh, uh, as the presentation goes, goes by. So I could see from your expressions that you're not happy when I said that what is the original Patwardhan. Now, uh, hmm. the third approach is the reverse breach extraction, which quite a few of the professors really prefer because that's the method uh, which give, gives the least amount of trauma to the, uh, to the uh, uterine incision as well as the baby. Other options, I'm just going to talk about few options like the fetal pillow, which is used quite a lot in Europe, but not so much in India, but I'll show you the video how it works. Then you can see the obstetric spoon. It is just like a, a forceps or one single blade of the forceps, but it is shaped in the form of a spoon and the seat snorkel. Again, uh, uh, they are being used as a vectus. So let me show you this one very beautiful video which I could find on the fetal pillow. I'm just, um, I'm just going to uh, show you this video and I'll put off the sound. But what uh, this device consists of is this uh, very soft uh, uh, pillow-like uh, structure, which you can see here. Let me move. Uh, okay. So this is how uh, uh, um, the pillow is you know, placed below the head and it is pushed a little bit posteriorly. So uh, uh, as you can see, 
Yes, in that way, below the head. Before, you know, when you're placing the patient on the table, first of all, you pay, take the, her in dorsal position and place the pillow. And when you are giving, after giving incision on the abdomen, then what you are going to do is you're inserting 180 um, cc's of normal slime through the port which has been given here. So what it will do, it will elevate the head almost three to four centimeters. And that is what is going to make the delivery of the head uh, very, very easy. So this fetal pillow actually uh, uh, is being used quite a lot in Europe and uh, it is showing a very good outcome. So I, I hope uh, uh, that uh, we, we may have some experience, though I have none, but it looks so beautiful and I hope some of our participants, if they can, if any of you have used, you may just put in the chat box your experience. What we have more experience and very good outcomes is the Patwardhan's technique. And what uh, I've been, I'm going to describe is the modified Patwardhan's technique. Now, uh, here in, we are worried about, you know, three types of position that the baby may be. One is when the back is anterior, another is when the back is lateral, and third is when the back is posterior, okay? So now when the back is anterior, what we are suggesting that the insert be a little bit higher, and uh, first of all, the delivery of the available shoulder, whatever shoulder presents to you, then you introduce your two fingers, you know, in, uh, so delivery of the other shoulder, so for first shoulder which comes to you, then the other shoulder, then you insert two fingers uh, on the, both the side of the chest, flexion of the trunk, bundle pressure, deliver the chest, abdomen and breech, and lastly you will deliver the, 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 the head of the baby. So I'm going to show you certain videos also here. So I'll just quickly move forward. So this is how sometimes you, you may see the ballooning and uh, your incision has to be at the level of the shoulders. First one shoulder, then the other one, you, uh, you will uh, insert your two fingers, deliver the chest, the trunk, the, uh, the breech, and finally the head of the baby. So uh, I'm just going to show you this video where uh, the, the Patwardhan technique is being done. So uh, what uh, uh, care this uh, surgeon is uh, taking is uh, that, yes, a little bit, uh, uh, the opening is of the incision is a little higher, uh, as you can see here. And uh, um, when the incision being extended, the scissor is being used instead of just stretching with the finger, the scissor is being used to extend the incisions for safety. And then as the one leg, one uh, arm is being removed. So the arm on the surgeon's side is the one which is presenting. So uh, that arm is being removed and a little bit of stretch on that arm. And then you go and reach the other arm, as you can see here, and the other arm is being removed. So this is the modified Patwardhan's technique. So one arm and the other arm, as you can see here. Then, so you can just observe how gentle the surgeon is. Little bit of under pressure will be needed. And this is how beautifully the, uh, the baby can come out. So this, I, I, what I have found from my experience is that this kind of uh, delivery of the baby actually leads to less trauma to the uterine incision and uh, uh, quite very well can be learned by the uh, your students also. So it is not that uh, it, it does not, it takes a, a training, but it, it, it really gives you good outcome. Now, what about when the, uh, the baby is in a lateral position? This is one video which is showing you Yes, the one when the baby is in the lateral position, you remove the arm which presents to you. Then you pull on that arm, okay, and you make the back anterior. Actually, you see in this baby, the back is lateral. So you just pull on that arm, give that arm to your assistant now. Now the back becomes anterior and then you go and remove the other arm on your side now. And then, of course, you go and remove the trunk, the chest, the, 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 the podalic part, and lastly, the, the head. So that is when you are, uh, you are uh, uh, going for a lateral 
uh, uh, so now what about when the back is posterior now here and comes the available shoulder then you introduce the hand towards the fundus the foot is gripped gently pulled out so that means the breech the leg on that side and then of course the other leg and lastly uh, you lift of the baby so this is actually the original patwardhans which was described which is more easy and better done in the back when back is posterior however i find that doing the reverse break procedure when the back is posterior is not only easy but uh, um, you know uh, gives better outcome as you can see in this uh, video you just go inside and you pick up the legs of the baby and very easily you can deliver the baby by the reverse breach so i find that the reverse breach is much better easy in the when the back is posterior so this is a systematic review and the meta analysis where the of the three techniques the primary outcome was uterine ex extension and the secondary outcome so maternal and neonatal morbidities and what was found that the risk of uterine extension infection mean blood loss was significantly higher with the push technique as compared to the reverse breech technique they did not actually find uh, you know evidence for the patwardhan method but i think uh, uh, we uh, can uh, have more meta analysis and uh, publication for because we find that the patwardhan method is equally good and i can vouch for the reverse breech extraction in case of the posterior back now what about the head being free floating again there is a technical problem when you try to deliver a floating head difficult extraction can be there in 3 to 4% of cases and, and this maybe is a spontaneously unengaged head or sometimes there is a deeply impacted head you try to disengage the head and then the head becomes floating so that these are the two uh, types of presentations which you can have and uh, uh, there could be a cord around neck there could be a cpd because of which uh, they, there could be a floating head now how how to manage this floating head there are four options in front of you one is stabilize the head with fundal pressure and give the incision at the maximum diameter of the head secondly is internal podalic version and reverse breech technique which i have shown you just now another is the vacuum use of vacuum or the forceps for the delivery now uh, uh, if you want to deliver by uh, by the uh, by the cephalic pole itself and without use of any other instrument just you have to give a little bit of fundal pressure the assistant will stabilize the fetus and then the surgeon will give incision at the lower segment just at the level of the head you the assistant has to keep on stabilizing uh, and uh, uh, if you allow the liquor actually to drain off and allow the head to little bit come down and then you will have to deliver the head that is one technique another technique is use of the vacuum vacuum is a very good uh, technique especially in in case of a floating head you have to place the vacuum at the flexion point at 3 cm from the posterior fontanelle as you can see in the picture this is a, a very good video which shows you how uh, a, a vacuum is actually applied in in a cesarean section here the metallic cup is being used uh, and here also we have to remember not to uh, make haste at all let the pressure build up very nicely and then only you uh, deliver the head so uh, uh, you know this is a really good technique as you can see you can use the metallic metallic cup but uh, the, the silastic cup which we nowadays have also equally good in fact i have we have a private practitioner in vardha who uses the vacuum uh, cup for all her deliveries maybe the floating head or not and i have been assisting her quite a lot so i do find it really really very good technique when you want to deliver a floating head 
In fact, you can use the forceps also very nicely. This uh, your outlet forces, which is your release forceps. This is a mental vertical uh, uh, diameter, which is uh, you know uh, uh, where the application is done. So here again in this video, you can see the application of forceps. Uh, and again, the scissor is being used um, to extend the uterine incision here. Now you can see the posterior blade will be placed. So you are introducing your hand first and the blade of the forcep is placed over the hand in this way, as you can see. So you hold the forcep blade almost vertically and introduce the blade. And the assistant will stabilize that blade of the forceps. So be very gentle, be very calm, no haste. Remove the Doyne's retractor and just elevate, and the baby will be delivered very easily. And you will find that this is a very good technique as far as the, uh, uh, um, the floating head is concerned. And of course, lastly, uh, the internal podalic version or the reverse breach technique. So you just go above uh, towards the fundus and catch hold of the legs. Be very careful that you don't bring the arm down and you bring the legs only and very nicely you could uh, uh, remove the baby by the uh, reverse breach technique. So this is one uh, systematic analysis where in the RCT where 150 patients with free floating head, 50 each in the uh, internal podalic, that is the breach extraction, the outlet forceps and the vacuum group, the va variables which were seen were time taken to extract the baby, the maternal and fetal complication. Results are that the significant reduction in time to extract the baby and maternal complication <clears throat> were less with the breach extraction group. So that is what uh, it's, it's considered quite a safe technique as far well as fetal floating head is concerned. Now, if you look at uh, uh, this, another um, uh, good publication for techniques for assisting difficult deliveries, uh, again, reverse breach technique uh, and uh, uh, your uh, push technique was seen in this. And here again, the reverse breach extraction was found to have a very, very good fetal outcome as compared to the other technique. So I think uh, I have also seen my professors very easily taking off out the breach and very nicely delivering the babies. So uh, just to look at the guidelines, when we are having these kind of complicated patients, first of all, we need to anticipate the potential difficulties, avoid complacency when we have high-risk cases. Your resources should be mobilized properly. That is a good assistant, your trained staff, and a well-planned well incision, good nicely palpating the abdomen first before deciding your technique, what you are going to do. So, that is, and of course, your assistant should be well versed with what you are doing. So, a person who is used to assisting you will be very good in case of uh, such complication. Avoid force while delivering, induction delivery time less than eight minutes, and uh, incision delivery time, you know, uh, three to four minutes must be the aim. Good neonatal support, I think, very important. You should have neonatal urges which should be present in the OT when you are being and such kind of case. And of course, a good friend who can be with you, uh, uh, another gynecologist can help you out if uh, any such kind of complicated cases are there. Suggestion as far as training is concerned is that when we are training uh, our residents, uh, supervised training sessions are needed for a deeply engaged as well as floating head. There is a usefulness for skills and drills like uh, you know the training which we are conducting today. So second stage C-section would, if you're having good training, then the confidence of the person doing the uh, surgery increases. And, uh, and of course, if we have good training for trial of instrumental delivery, then probably these second stage AC sections also will reduce. So with that, I conclude, anticipate, be prepared, seek help, 
do not panic be gentle reflect discuss and share what you have learned debrief and whatever knowledge you have you share with others so acknowledgement for the videos dr mitra saxena dr manju puri and i also acknowledge the practical objective committee for today's webinar thank you thank you so much and i would now request dr sujata darvi madam for the comments yeah so thank you dr surekha for giving excellent scientific deliberation right for deeply engaged head that is right from patwadan's maneuver to push and pull technique and for floating head vacuum and the forceps delivery or even a reverse bridge delivery and i must tell you there are different techniques which are available but for the residents to know they need to have a training because these things don't come just like that okay they need to have a little bit of training so as an emergency they will be able to manage the same as such and for rest of the people all of us we have learned so many things over a period of time we can always tell the residents or always teach the residents in fact on our c section trolley we always have a pair of forceps blade irrespective of the indications or whatever it may be forceps blade is always there because vacuum does take at times little bit for the pressure to build up and things like that but forceps blades are always there so it is very important and mandatory for all the residents to know about these are the difficult situations at the time of c section thank you so much for giving me an opportunity thank you so uh, thank you dr yeah yeah dr mitra oh, actually why i was making a face was that always parag who is the son in law grand son in law of patwardhan he has always clarified that there isn't any modified patwardhan modified yeah and there is only patwardhan which is for back anterior and the other is whatever comes first so one hand one leg and the other you go at the front and bring it down or like you said rightly in the lateral um, presentation you pull the arm check it out and depending upon which side arm it is if it is your side you pull it to your side idea is just to keep the back anterior so that is yeah. excellent and that's why I, i mean because parag has been saying it again and again that there is, there is a, not nothing a modified, like modified ha huh? so yeah. that's why so that's what parag has been saying i just yeah, want to yeah. say one thing that when we are doing um in uh, second stage although i am of the old school so the push one was very good with me put my own hand fully inside de rotated and put it above the brim so there is no possibility of any extension but yes over these last two years and with deliberations from dr manju you i have done patwardhan and i have shared it on the group also so in patwardhan again a jewel coin incision would be very helpful because you yes. get adequate place then also placing your uterine incision higher it's a second I, stage cesarean yeah. the cervix is merged with the vaginal wall so giving a lower incision having double mind ki is aise nikalun ya waise pehle se soch lo kaise nikalna hai so put a incision higher up you will never find difficulty in doing patwardhan so yes. that is the thing yeah. that so we always actually giving pro especially in like much in patwardhan technique that any c section which is second stage will give a higher incision and we will yes. do but and then joel all our residents are and uterine incision and yeah. the only problem works very well comes, but i have seen please. reverse bridge also working very well our so samal madam who is there but, professor here she does reverse bridge so well that we just actually, keep on see, you know, yeah. if your incision is on a higher side if your incision is on a higher side you the uterus is you know more stretchable you get more place and you, you can bring out the reverse breech or the patwardhan the only problem is if it's a yeah. heavy baby and the liker is drained then patwardhan may become difficult comes little even <laughs> yeah <laughs> then it is difficult again you don't have to time when jab wo bahut mota bachcha hota hai bahut heavy bachcha hota hai liker nahi hota to patwardhan bhi difficult hota hai but again yes, the patwardhan is don't panic and ek nikalo dusra gently nikalo pura haath dalo bundle pressure zyada acha do and pull it out without causing soft tissue injury on the abdomen so excellent yes. thank you so much thank, thank you very much thank you ma'am the back thank is posterior second if the back is posterior it is better to take out a, that arm whichever shoulder comes out and the leg then that will come leg. way come out yeah. much better rather than turning the back anterior and things like that whether they got first part whether or not there is any yes, place ma to definitely ma'am We would love a video if you have of uh, 
uh, of the you know the back posterior that's right so thank you very much over to you jaya for the next there was surekha um, one question ma'am there was one question in the chat box about a transverse line and uh, the extraction there so i think you can address that i think uh, it's quite uh, evident we have to just pull uh, search for the leg and bring the leg out and and there i would so say a, a u shaped insertion is very good whenever i'm yeah, doing so transverse line like a drain lower segment is not formed i go for a u insertion so that if there is extension and there is lot of stretch wo u shape mein na wo flap aise upar jata hai aur bahut room mil jata hai so the chances of lateral extension is less in u shape is yeah, yeah so dr dipika would like to uh, uh, take a minute for uh, jackson park yeah a short Please. break a short break for the delegates Jackson Pal Pharmaceuticals Limited proudly presents Pro Retro Micronized Digestrone Tablet 10 mg. Jackson Pal Pharmaceuticals is manufacturing all the active pharmaceutical ingredients and intermediates concerning digestrone making India self-reliant. Atmanirbhar Bharat. Vocal for local. Go for Pro Retro. Thank you very much. This is our uh, micronized digestron brand of uh, 36 months uh, shelf life, and it is bioequivalent to the innovator molecule. Uh, looking forward to your support, assisting motherhood, de delivering happiness. Pro retro. Thank you very much, Jackson Pal. Thank you very much, Amit and Pika, for this platform. And I hand over to Jaya to for the next session. Ma'am, I'm not able to stop myself expressing. Uh, actually, it was such a such a nice uh, session, Madam. It was Marathi Tapan Netra Deepak Ji Manto. It was just a treat to our eyes, and I remember one incident. What you used to tell of your residency to us when we were resident. Uh, you had one registrar who had stuck her hand below the deeply engaged head. At those times, we used to feel it funny, but as a consultant, I really feel it's a nightmare, and we must have to tackle. that situation uh, with very uh, positive attitude and calm mind yeah, i i do remember jaya when uh, my consultant's hand got stuck in between the head of the baby and the pelvic bone you know bone the surface she couldn't remove her arm and i had to go from uh, the assistant side to her side i was resident i had to actually pull on her arm to remove the hand so that is what jaya was talking about yes it is a nightmare but we have to be calm yes ma'am uh, moving on to the another session that is uh, how to deal with another complication that is extension of uterine incision and broad ligament hematoma i request dr dipika madam please uh, for the slide so speakers respected speaker for today's uh, this session is dr sashi lata kabra madam and chairpersons are professor kiran pandey madam and dr manoj aglavi sir so uh, i would like to introduce dr uh, professor kiran pandey madam she is well known uh, consultant she is icog governing council member she is president of kanpur menopo society she is professor and head of the department of uh, gsvm medical college kanpur she has work experience uh, of active participation of all activities in foxy from 1986 She has more than thirty-six years of teaching experience, and presently she is the chairperson elect of Thank medical you. education. Thank you, Surika. Thank you. That's good. Eh? Then we yes, have Dr. Manoj Agla, the chairperson, Dr. Manoj Agla, uh, sir. He is consultant laparoscopic surgeon and infertility specialist at Siddhi Vinayak Hospital, Lakhni Bandara. He is secretary of Bandara OBGYN Society and ex assistant professor IGGM Sina. I welcome you, sir. Uh, over to you, Doctor Pandey. Over to the chairperson. Thank you, Doctor Surika. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So thank you very much for kind words of introduction, and I'm really thankful to each and every person for giving me this. opportunity and electing me as a chairperson medical education committee uh, really nice to see dr mitra dr manju puri dr surekha and all these her 
team doing excellent work. It's a fantastic webinar, I would say, of a very practical use. Well, my presently, I have to introduce Dr. Shashi Kabra Maheshwari. And uh, she is a very well-known person. She is a um, NBE faculty and resource person. As already you can see, she has organized more than 50 workshops on PPH. That's a real credit to her. And she's recipient of various awards, Foxy Award, APJ Abdul Kalam Appreciation Award, IMA WDW Karambir Award, IMA Appreciation, and many more. Nice to see Dr. Shashi Gabra. You are also yeah. very active in IMA. I have also been there, so I can understand all what uh, all you must have, how much hard work you have done it. She has also received the Rashtriya Gaurav Apart Chairman. Okay, ma'am, we can Chairman. start. Thank you so much. Okay, okay, right, right. Actually, I was not able to control my temptation to introduce more and more about you. So very nice speaking about you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for such a kind introduction. So madam is going to talk about a very... I mean, common uh, but most threatening complications, the extension of incidents and how to deal with it. Um, in the meantime, she's up uh, starting her video on the presentation. I'll just like to share Dr. Surika, very nice videos by each and every uh, speakers and uh, very informative talks, small, small talks. So... Madam, you can start yeah, you. with your presentation. Yeah, uh, yeah. Is my slide visible? No, no. 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 It's not, not visible. Okay. No. Yeah. <laughs> please, uh, please share again. Yeah. I'm Stop share and do it again. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now yeah. it is visible. Okay. You can make it... Uh, on yeah. slideshow. Yeah. So is it visible now? Yes, yeah. it is. Please go ahead. Yeah. So very good afternoon, everyone. And uh, first of all, my sincere thanks to my dear friend, Dr. Sureka Tayare, the convener of the program, co-convener, Dr. Rashmi Kahar and Dr. Trishala Dhimre, and coordinator, Dr. Jaya Kore. And thank you, Dr. Kiran Pandey, for such a kind introduction. So. Let's start with the topic. Uh, the rate of cesarean section ascension is approximately 50%, 15%, and it is four times greater when performed in labor. Uh, that means uh, in how much advanced labor it is being done, it is directly proportional to that. And the most significant independent risk factor for the cesarean extension in the second stage labor areas, this, is, this has been repeatedly told by our all previous speakers. So this is very important. We should have a proper training for second cesarean section. And regarding the frequency, 25% of the second stage of labor is one to th when labor is one to three hours, and another 32% extension occur when labor is progressed for four to five hours. And uh, these extension may in, in fact go up to the cervix. So in the second stage of labor, the extension uh, occurs and the main causes are deeply engaged head, which has been described uh, how to tackle with this by Dr. Sureka. The lack of amniotic fluid and thin down lower segment is also a very important cause of the extension. So when uh, we talk about the management, then the first and foremost thing is the ages of the incision should be identified and sutured. But sometimes uh, even multiple sutures uh, uh, and figure of age switches do not help. And then, then we have to do a uterine artery ligation or internal anic artery ligation. This uh, picture is by Bill Lynch and I wanted to show this picture to revise uh, where we have to place the uterine artery ligation stitches. Uh, these are the places where we apply the uterine artery ligation. And here I on, also want to show the ovarian artery ligation stitches. Uh, you see that ovarian artery is this one and it is a direct branch of abdominal aorta. We do not ligate it here. We ligate it here where there is anastomosis between the uterine and ovarian artery. Uh, uterine branch of ovarian artery and ovarian branch of vagina. So this picture I purposefully put. I wanted to show you that, that when we ligate the uterine artery, you see this is the uterine artery and we have to take this 
whole path because if we pass the suture like this then path will be left so this this suture will be very thick goes through the musculature the same is shown in another structure that this is very important when we ligate the train artery and we can use number one polyclectin suture vicryl and uh, in extreme cases where these two do not solve the purpose then we may have to go for hysterectomy also so sometimes this extension may also extend to the bladder and the tone bladder edges should be identified and sutured into continuous layers by three or four delayed absorbable sutures. Uh, most of the time, the obstetrician can manage it, and when it is not manageable by yes, then we call our we can call our surgeon friends. And uh, sometimes ureters and ureteral orifice may also be injured, and we should seek the help of the urosurgeon. And occasionally, the baby may be delivered accidentally through the incision in the vagina. And hence, it is essential to identify the lower segment properly and correct incision to deliver the baby through the lower uterine segment. So, some uh, sometimes uh, uh, we may have extensions during repeat scissor insection. So, there are the precautionary points which we should take, like maximum information we have to gather about the previous delivery, where was it done, what was the surgery method, and we should open the abdomen by a longitudinal incision. It is better, and the incision should be a bit higher. And uh, you know, in longitudinal incision, we get a lot of space, and uh, sometimes if internal lacrimal ligation is required, then it is easier. And uh, what I usually do, you know, in my hospital, almost there is 10,000 deliveries per annum, and we get a lot of cases of repeat cesarean and extension. So I open, if I anticipate digestion, I open the abdomen by longitudinal incision, whatever the previous incision is there, whether it is financial, anything. And then in the upper part of the peritoneum, much away from the bladder, I make an incision in the peritoneum. I just make a window, then I peep through my eyes in the window, and then under vision, under vision, I can see the abdominal cavity inside, and under vision, I cut the parietal peritoneum according to my convenience. So look through the window, extend the peritoneal incision under vision, can take up care taken during the peritoneal incision because adhesion may have occurred. And you know, everybody knows that the sap dissection should be done if bladder is adhered. So there are few conditions where the chances of extension are more like floating head, deep linkage head, malpositions like duplex head, malpresentations like breach and transverse like prematurity, multifetal pregnancy, uh, fetal malformations and conjoint twins. So the challenges due to poorly performed LUS is in the case of prematurity, fibroids, adhesions in the lower uterine segment and anterior low length placenta are anticipated. And there's some uterine anomalies like biconate uterus sometimes creates problem and in extreme cases when access to a lower uterine segment is very difficult uh, sometimes we have to we may have to resort to classical cesarean section so in some as we have been talking in some special circumstances we have to use transverse curvilinear or occasionally j shaped incision it maximizes the available space and occasionally an inverted t shaped or low vertical especially in cases of impacted transverse lie and if taken, then we have to document it and we should conceal the patient for elective LSCS next time. So for deeply engaged head, uh, as discussed by Dr. Surekha in detail, these, uh, these are the techniques which we can use to prevent extension. And a uh, few words about transverse lie, incision or lower trend segment should be liberal. One should feel for fetal back, trace and hold feet, carry out internal pedalic version and deliver as breach. And in case if baby's hand comes out, reposit it and trace back from the shoulder. Then uh, coming to the broad ligament hematomas, little introduction about broad ligament. All of you know that it is a double fold of peritoneum bounded superiorly by the round ligament, inferiorly by the cardinal and uterocertal ligament, and laterally by infundibular pelvic ligament. Even the mesosalpings of the fallopian tube is contiguous with the broad ligament. So the primary blood supply to the uterus is via the uterine or ovarian arteries, and these blood vessels and astomos near the upper lateral aspect of the uterus. And blood from the upper uterus, the ovary, and the upper part of the broad ligament is collected by several veins which form the pampiniform plexus in the broad ligament. And this is the reason uh, sometimes heavy bleeding occurs. So this broad ligament hematoma, sometimes we face at the emergencies in labor room, and the incidence is 1 is to 500 to 1 in 20,000. And uh, the reason is uh, traumatic uh, PPS, lacerations that tear to the cervix or upper vagina or uterus. And uh, they constitute about 20% of the all causes of uh, PPH. And sometimes they may also occur along with tubal ligation. You know, because if there is some accidental injury on the ovary or on the vein, every structure is vascular during obstetrics and during LSCS. So they may cause hematoma. And sometimes even large blood loss occur, dissects into the retroperitoneal spaces. And uh, 
you know, broad legami toma we can face paraoperatively while performing a cesarean, or sometimes patients do come postoperative also. So these are the pictures of broad ligament hematoma of my own hospital. And uh, the sources of broad ligament bleeding is venous, arterial, or both. And arterial bleeding usually results in rapidly expanding hematoma, and venous bleeding typically results in slower expansion. So sometimes uh, the diagnosis of broad ligament may be made late, as I have told you. A patient usually comes with unexplained shock with features of internal hemorrhage. And uh, if not diagnosed in time, it can have a fatal progress to maternal mortality. And the definitive treatment uh, is uh, variable according to size, location, and severity. This is a picture, ultrasound picture, of a patient who came late and she was very, very anemic. So, so this was the big hematoma. Uh, sometimes broad ligament hematoma should be considered in patients who are coming with anemia and vaginal bleeding. And sometimes they may come with hemodynamic instability, but still we have to keep this in mind. And the recent intrauterine infections usually predispose to hematoma formation. So history is also very important. Now coming to the management of broad ligament hematoma, for operatively, if there is a small hematoma, we can simply press it by applying direct pressure. Or sometimes we apply figure of eight sutures on smaller blood vessels and a uh, few vessels may be cauterized, but we have to take care of the ureter. And if the hematoma is extending, then we have to cut. There is a thin layer covering the hematoma. So we should know that there is one word in obstetrics, which is called do not panic. Always maintain your temperament or always remain calm. If the hematoma is increasing in size, no worry. You just cut the thin layer which is covering the hematoma and open it, remove the clots and see which vascular structure is bleeding and take care of that. So this is a video it is shared by Dr. Surekha. So this is a case of broad ligament hematoma. You see here there is a heavy bleeding and he's creating a bladder flap. This is the first step. Yeah. Now this UV fold is open and now he's palpating the pulsation. And the suture will be from anterior to posterior, two centimeter medial to the uterine artery to include the myometrium in a stitch. We take part of myometrium and the uterine artery is in the myometrium, as I've shown in my earlier sketch. Now this is a posteriorly, it has been taken out. Now from posterior to anterior, it will again come. And we use finger as a guide to pass suture from posterior to anterior. And uh, the part is through a vascular part of broad ligament, the selection to the uterine vessels. And this stitch is basically U shaped. Now it is tied. The first row should be a double turn, and then two knots each in reverse direction. So this is the, we use number one bicolor most of the time for this. And then this is, this is again second suture. Uh, in, on uterine artery, we usually apply two sutures, one lower and one upper. So this is the upper suture. Yeah, the similar lead is to be done on the opposite side. Here also, little dissection on the peritoneum so that we can expose the uterine artery and can palpate it properly. And then again, with similar method, we'll do. From anterior to posterior and then from posterior to anterior. So spe uh, special care when the ureter is nearby, the ureter crosses under the uterine artery one to two centimeter lateral to the uterus at the level of internal cervical loss. And it is also at least near the base of the infundibular pelvic ligament. This has, we have been reading from right our MBBS days. And exteriorizing the uterus may facilitate ligation and separation from the ureter. Remember one thing, previously we used to exteriorize the uterus while performing the cesarean section. Then the, those days were, were come in which in those days we started uh, doing everything, keeping the uterus inside the abdomen. But nowadays new literature says that whenever there is doubt for anything, you exteriorize the uterus and do the sutures. By exteriorizing the uterus, you will be better able to see all type of tears. Uh, this is uh, another video. Uh, this we have uh, 
made in our own hospital. And here I want to show you the uterine arterial ligation and the ovarian arterial ligation. Uh, it was shot by my dear colleague, Dr. Soma. Palpating the uterine artery, part of my material chunk taken and needle taken will be taken out to an avascular plane. She's palpating the avascular plane, avascular plane to the bone ligament. You, you can see here, you can appreciate that biopill number one is being used and bladder flap has already been pushed down. It is very important to push the bladder flap, otherwise ureter may come in pain. In first row, first row should be a double throw and the rest of the two rows will be each in the reverse direction. This is what is called the surgical knot. The higher stitch, she is trying to help it. Again, from anterior to posterior, posterior to anterior. Now this is ovarian artery ligation. This we made recently for our PPH workshop. So this is not an ovarian artery ligation. This is a ligation of the anastomosis between the uterine branch of ovarian artery and ovarian branch of uterine artery. Dr. Kiran, am I audible and is my video visible? Yeah. <laughs> Your video is very much visible and you are audible also. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank and you are appreciating your videos also. Yo, thank you so much. So you see here how we are taking stitches of that anastomotic part. So this is the site for ovarian artery ligation. You know, I always call it is a misnomer. Ovarian, it is not an ovarian artery ligation. This is basically ligation of the anastomosis. So last but the dose, not the least is internal iliac artery ligation because sometimes the uterine artery gets retracted in the broad ligament hematoma and they are in such a pool of blood, we can't see anything. Patient is going into shock. So the only answer is internal iliac artery ligation. And the second word, in interventional radiology for person embolization. Yeah, we do discuss it every time in all the seminars, but you see the time still is there. Around, around 15 to 20 years will be passed when every hospital in India will have this radiology for vessel embolization because we require a 24 hour radiologist in these facilities. So it is my request to everyone, every obstetrician, that you should learn internal iliac artery ligation. Whatever is in your hand, if you have the skill of doing an internal iliac artery ligation, why you should become dependent on a radiologist or a machine for vessel embolization. So learn internal iliac artery ligation. So in rare cases, hysterectomy or oophorectomy may be required. So few words about internal iliac artery ligation. You know that uh, this common abdominal aorta divides into two common iliac arteries and they in turn divide into internal iliac and external iliac. Internal means it is inside, medial side. And this is another picture by B. Lynch. Uh, this is common iliac, this is uh, external iliac, and this is internal. You see an internal iliac gives a posterior branch uh, immediately after this origin, and we have to ligate the anterior division. So around three centimeters below the bifurcation, we can ligate it. Uh, this is uh, uh, Dr. When I talked to Dr. Sureka, Dr. Sureka told me that there will be an exclusive session for internal iliac artery ligation. So I'm not showing the complete video, but I'm just showing you the video of how to open the retroperitoneum. You know, the first step in internal iliac artery ligation is to open the retroperitoneum because it is a retroperitoneum structure. So you just see, I'm sharing one of my own videos. <laughs> This is the round loop. Uh, can you hear my voice? Uh, can you hear the audio of the video? Yeah, yeah. Audio, video, very good. 
please go ahead so, i i want to ask whether the audio of the video is coming or my sound is coming no no you will have to uh, speak the audio or okay, video okay, okay okay so you see so this is round ligament you see and this case is not hysterectomized uterus is there this is round ligament and i am making a nick in the thin peritoneum of the round ligament almost at two third or one third you see i made a nick and i am just cutting the thin peritoneum taking care not to injure any structure which is below and i am moving parallel to the infundibular pelvic ligament up to the lateral pelvic wall i i am cutting about 5 to 7 cm of the peritoneum so you see the thin peritoneum i am going parallel to the infundibular pelvic ligament up to the lateral pelvic wall and you see i have cut around 5 to 7 cm now now i have kept all the instruments and only with the help of two fingers i will enlarge the rectal peritoneal window because big vascular structures are there and we should never injure them so see it's a loose areolar tissue and you so you see it never bleeds it is so easy and next next things we have to we have to identify the inverted y which i have shown in my earlier picture you know you see it is beautifully shown this is the this is the ureter in the medial flap and we have to work we have to work laterally this is ureter in the medial flap this is psoas muscle and you can see the inverted y this is external iliac this is internal iliac this is this is in, in inverted v of common iliac artery so so uh, bifurcation is to be recognized the upper stem is the common iliac artery and uh, the lower stem of v are external iliac artery and internal iliac artery internal iliac is a medial structure and when we press the external iliac artery the femoral pulse goes so this is how we recognize them uh, next time when i get an opportunity i will share the whole live video which i have so these are the relations of internal iliac artery and when i have shown you the picture in video and after that we dissect it this dissection is not as beautiful because this is a picture but we can always uh, remove the sheath and we can make internal iliac artery visible and we pass the suture through internal iliac artery so uh, how it, why do we perform internal iliac artery because bilateral ligation results in 80% reduction in pulse pressure 50% reduction of blood flow and arterial flow gets converted into venous flow so this facilitates coagulation bleeding is reduced and life is saved in many many cases we have done in last 20 years of my career in ddu hospital and it is initially technically difficult but you know practice makes one perfect and this is the special precaution uh, that the, the right angle clamp or this is called mixture forceps this we introduce when we remove the sheath from internal iliac artery then from lateral to medial side because if we put it reverse then we will just end up injuring the internal iliac clamp so this is very important tip so thank, thank you, you so very much, much dr shashi and over to dr kiran for her comments hello very nice presentation dr shashi you have uh, uh just a minute sorry <clears throat> very nice presentation and nice videos uh just few things i wanted to uh highlight <clears throat> very rightly you have said what <clears throat> what happens in the broad ligament hematoma it's almost all the time that your uterine artery retracts and there it is very difficult if you can separate you can drain yeah. out but to trace out the uterine artery of course we can go along with the flap and may reach some time to the origin but otherwise it this is the time where internal iliac like artery ligation becomes very very important yeah. to actually save because otherwise later on once you have done even a strictly uterine artery has been retracted so later on it can, the patient can bleed so that is one point and the second thing internal iliac artery ligation as you rightly said all the post graduate must learn because this is the at in the emergency time life saving procedure yes. but that you have to do in a, a not at the time of the, when the patient is bleeding but beforehand you have to get them practiced 
show them the anatomy only then they can and matlab if you yeah. uh, show them clearly at that time i just want to add one thing what i do i tell my residents that when we are doing gynecological surgeries so yes. where in that case in that case when we are opening the uterocecal peritoneum we just push it down and then we make the uterus straight and we apply the clamps from train as we don't do this open the retro peritoneum regularly routinely killing says that you open the retro peritoneum routinely and an experienced surgeon can open the retro peritoneum in 20 to 30 seconds okay. if there's in a gynecological case so from this they can start and later on they can move to obstetric side that is what i was coming to okay, that okay. identifying the internal iliac and the ureter in a gynecological non complicated cases if they keep on doing every yeah. time then they with the eyes become trained to it because all the time ureter has to be kept on the medial and this and that all those points have to be understood when patient is not bleeding otherwise it is not possible that in emergency time yeah. one can do it so that is one point yeah. i think thank uh, you very much I, yes yeah uh, dr sareka if you permit me one or two points i just wanted to add and one experience i wanted to share also i had one patient which is a most unusual complication i think in fact in my whole life i have also seen only once and uh, maybe sometimes someone comes across this that was a case where was a signif very significant divarication of recti and the whole uterus has come out from that divarication recti anteriorly and it was in fact anterior posterior the anatomy had gone so what i want to say and when we saw that patient when my actually resident initially they do so then the consultancies so they just could not identify which is that what is that where is the anterior aspect and where is so we had to push that uterus back in every time when we examine we had to push it back into the abdomen through that divaricated recti and then only we could identify which is the anterior surface and which is the posterior surface so this sometimes uh, because many a times in the medical colleges residents are performing emergency cesarean section so they uh, i mean this is one thing which i wanted to share always identify the Uh, and of first make the uterus into the anatomical position correct anatomical position and then give the think of giving plan the incision otherwise you might land up the second uh, one more thing in the same way there's another problem because you are discussing the different problems when the uterus is lower segment of the uterus is not formed in certain cases like when we have to do planned in the uh, termination of the pregnancy in certain case a patient is not in labor not near about it but because of some comorbidity or other things we have to open it and their lower segment is not formed so that becomes a, again a problem incision has to be very much planned in fact the i think dr mitra suggested only that that u shaped incision gives a very good choice the uterus opens like a flap because otherwise lower down you don't have much space whatever incision you will go give it will extend so that also one has to kept so whenever uh, it is being uh, planned cesarean and the seg uterine segment is not formed please again look for the anatomy and then give the incision thirdly the when we were talking of extensions of course the already precaution has been told about the lateral extensions by giving you incision but sometimes lower down incision the extensions do occur and in fact one is not careful even they go if the, uh, we are doing operating in a second stage of cesarean section they do go even up to the anterior lip of the vagina the vagina they reach up to that and in those cases also it becomes difficult the pay people are not uh, i mean residents are not trained to identify the they sometime even the actually if you remember many of you must have experienced the posterior wall of the uterus comes out in a fold and i have seen one uh, pers resident stitching the posterior uterine wall to the incision anterior and then no os was there then we were called and then we identified and that was thing so in those cases giving a i mean extension dealing with the extension becomes very important of course all those precautions dr sureka which you told in cases of the deeply impacted uterus because those are the cases where let 
deep down in incisions the extensions do occur so there you have to take a uh, very much precaution and there actually the stay sutures do help us whatever is seen always stitch that with the help of that go little down with the second stitch then go little down and by that you gradually and you have to take care of this also that the anteriorly the you bladder is there so i mean very carefully and that bladder plexus is there that can also bleed so this is how the let the uh, lower down uterine incision has also to be seen and another thing i think t shaped incision should be avoided as far as possible now there i mean there's not much scope for it unless and until you are stuck and you can't do anything otherwise plan yeah, your incision i do agree uh, it should be avoided but if needed i know if you are stuck yeah, then yeah, you, you have to do anything yes, yes. that yeah. is also then, very important so if it of is of course the baby saving and the mother saving is it, most important you know uh, because we can definitely suture it and uh, there is no need to panic be uh, very careful uh, no. uh, very calm and that's very important yes. so mitra for yes, your last that, that, point that, that, that because i think uh, yeah. i want to really really congratulate you sureka um for so many things firstly abhi shuru karte hain aaj ki webinar excellent deliberations cesarean section is like hanuman chalisa jitni baar padhte rahoge utni baar you will be equipped to face your next challenge better so sureka you deserve my big applause because you not you kept four very important things every chairperson's inputs are excellent and congratulations for winning the chairpersonship a dream come true for you and me and i'm so happy that this is the first time we are celebrating she is the most deserved person for that were useful input for all our audience so also thank dr you. kiran pande a heartiest congratulations thank to you, you. Thank you. with thank you, you as the medical education chairperson we really hope that academics in foxy will again go one notch higher and your inputs today were very good a few of my inputs also that there have been instances where just because of not taking anatomical landmarks in position um, doctors have opened the posterior wall especially when it's acutely dextro rotated uterus these problems happen in undiagnosed unicornoid uteruses also where you haven't bothered to identify where is the other um, round ligament etc so as the mantra don't be in a panic assess everything then place your incisions according to what your extraction will be so a heartiest congratulations you. to everybody thank also, you dr mitra let's announce our first uh, workshop of internal elic ligation on <laughs> 17th of june in navi mumbai so i welcome all of you wholeheartedly and even if we have less people here in navi mumbai we are going to replicate it in all the parts of the country with all of you all as faculty and participants because really as dr kiran has said that in emergency hum nahi seekh sakte internal elic ligation even if somebody says ki gynecological case mein dekh lo how many of us in private sector have it's the not, it's not actually it's not in. exactly the same but yes we can learn in gynec cases but, no, but sureka we have, have to start in gynecological cases we have to start doing it with you in dr kiran dr shashi dr manju and all of our wonderful teachers in the medical college we are going to take this model of our workshop all over physically taki logon ka confidence badh jaye jab wo dead mein dekhenge living ke videos dekhenge to apne patients mein zarur zarur hum unko yes, dekhenge we have some at least Mother, so the workshop is at ICOG conference <laughs> at Mumbai, and the workshop is on seventeenth of June. And Sureka, तुम्हारे तुम्हारे कमेटी के लिए एक काम है with the practical obstetrics committee. Now that we have discussed cesarean section thread bed, so we are going to design a study where we are going to do two layer closure versus one layer closure, followed by healing and symptomatology. We will do the tutorials for the. transfer channel scan and you are going to design it and we will do it we will generate our data definitely, right? definitely. i have very high hopes from you thank you dr I'm mitra we had 387 participants today that itself speaks volumes 
for yeah. all the speakers who have done a great job today. So thank you very much the speakers, uh, Dr. Manjupuri, ma'am, who has taken great efforts to make this uh, uh, presentation for today, Dr. Mitra Saxena, then Dr. Shashila Takabra, Dr. Manoj, who has, you know, been there throughout and proxy for Dr. Lakshmi Shrikhande and our Dr. Kalyan Barmade also. Thank you, Dr. Manoj and Dr. Kiran Pandey for wonderful, wonderful, wonderful inputs and and thank you very much, Dr. Deepika and uh, Amit Saxena. We would also like to thank Dr. Rajendra Singh Patesi, sir, Dr. Kiran uh, Kutkoti, and Dr. Sujata Dalvi, who are our office bearers from uh, MOX. So over to you, Jaya, for the closing remarks, and with that, we'll end. As we are concluding this webinar now, myself, Dr. Jaya Tulaskar, uh, Secretary DSOGS, on behalf of DSOGS, MOX, and Vidarbha Isopa, I want to uh, propose a vote of thanks to all the esteemed guests and guests of honor dignitaries um, who have taken out time from their busy schedule and graced this occasion with their presence. A big thank to you, to our esteemed speakers and chairpersons for their wonderful talk and inputs. And uh, ma'am has already given a vote of thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Jaya. There have been some requests for sharing the ovarian ligation uh, video again. So we'll be sharing the whole of the recording of the webinar so uh, uh, the participants can see again and again. So thank you very much, everybody. And we'll meet again with more videos, more demonstration, more teaching and more learning. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. So this recording remains available on our uh, Jackson Paul Pharmaceuticals. That is our Facebook and the link was also shared in the chat box. Which Very is nice webinar. Three cheers. Thank you, Deepika, Amit, and Jessica. Thank you so much. And just a reminder of the product. It's a micronized didrogestron 10 mg tablet pro retro. Our Nari division also has Verena nano silver gel uh, for healing post uh, cesarean scar, probably. And then we have Cystidia M, which is a combination of Minestol, Dichironestol, L-methyl folate, vitamin D3. And then finally, Uliprist. Uliprist acetate 5 mg is back uh, after the DCGI has approved it once again for the treatment. You need to be um, careful about the liver function test. So have the liver function test before prescribing Uliprist and after every 15 days, that is the say. And if it is more than twice, uh, raised above uh, the levels, then you have to stop. So thank you all so much. And we look forward to your uh, presence once again. That will be on Tuesday, 24th of May. The webinar ID is there. You can all note down and register. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sureka, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you so Sureka much, and everybody. All. Bye. Thank you, all the bye, bye, Dr. Sureka. Dr. Yeah, Mitra, thank you so very Dr. much, dear.